Bonjour and welcome back to your course on the history of the United States. This is your professor, Philippe Girard. In the first part of this lecture on feminism, we covered the very conservative norms that applied to women in the 1950s when it came to sexuality or marriage or the workplace. And then we talked about all the changes that took place in the 1960s, namely the sexual revolution and the creation of a feminist movement that fought for equal rights. Moving on to the 70s, our story is very much one of a glass half full and half empty. The great society programs of LBJ, like Medicaid and Medicare, they hope to eliminate poverty, but the U.S. never fully got there. The civil rights reformers like MLK, they hoped to achieve full racial equality, but they only achieved a partial victory. And that is the same story with feminism today. If you look at women's roles in the 1950s and you compare the situation to now, a lot of progress has been made. But full equality has not been achieved, and in fact there has been some backsliding recently when it comes to reproductive rights. So let's start with the successes. When it comes to reproductive rights, an early success was access to the birth control pill in 1960, because now there was a fairly safe, effective, affordable contraceptive method that was controlled by women. Some states still refused to let women take the pill, largely because of lobbying by conservative religious groups, but the Supreme Court came to the rescue in 1965 with the Griswold v. Connecticut decision. And that Supreme Court decision held that women had a constitutional right to privacy, and so the states could not prevent married women from getting access to the pill. The other key legal victory in the Supreme Court came in 1973 with the Roe v. Wade decision, when women obtained the right to an abortion all across the country. This was not a full, absolute right. It's not like women could get an abortion five minutes before the baby was due. But instead, abortion was an option for women as long as the fetus was not yet viable outside the womb, so roughly 24 weeks. After that, abortion would be available, but only if the mother's life was in danger. Just to be clear, abortions existed before Roe v. Wade. Gloria Steinem had one, for example. Uh, so here were the options if you became pregnant as a woman before Roe v. Wade made it legal. So if you're rich enough, your parents could fly you to an area where abortion was legal, and then you would pay a doctor out of pocket to get that abortion. If you were not rich enough, then you would have a back alley abortion involving different chemicals that might be dangerous to your health, or could anger, or whatever makeshift technique, and thousands of women died of botched abortions. Or women would remain pregnant willy-nilly and then have the baby anyway, and then give it up for adoption or raise the child themselves against their will. To guarantee the right to an abortion under Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court justices had to do a bit of legal jujitsu because if you read the Constitution, the word abortion is never mentioned there. That document was drafted by men all the way back in the 1780s, so the issue of women's reproductive rights, that was not exactly at the top of their agenda. In fact, the word woman does not even appear in the original Constitution, which is why a special amendment had to be passed in 1919 to grant women the right to vote. So in 1973, the justices had to discover a right to privacy in the Constitution by reading between the lines. And indeed, there is kind of one. For example, the government cannot enter your home without your knowledge or consent or without a court order. So you could say if you have a right of privacy in your home or if the government cannot snoop through your emails, then there should be some right to privacy in your womb as well. The government should not mandate that a woman finish her pregnancy and have a child against her will. The arguments on the other side, people who opposed Roe v. Wade, would be largely based on originalism. And originalism, that's a doctrine stating that the Supreme Court should not be reading between the lines and should stick to the original literal version of the Constitution what is in the text. So if the Constitution says nothing about women or abortion, well, so be it. Congress can always step in at a later date and pass new laws or add amendments, but it's not up to Supreme Court justices to make that decision. The other arguments against Roe v. Wade would be based more on morality and religion. An unborn child, and that's the term that is preferred by the pro-life movement, would have rights of its own, and so a woman should not be allowed to terminate a life just because it is inconvenient to her career. And notice how the vocabulary changes from one side to the other. People on either side of the debate are speaking past each other because they don't even use the same words. On one side, you have the pro-life movement, and on the other side, the pro-choice movement. 
On one side, they speak of unborn children. On the other, it is fetuses. But speaking from within the realm of the feminist movement, which is our perspective today, Roe v. Wade was seen as a major step forward because now women would not have to resort to back alley abortions and potentially die as a result, and they would have control over their reproductive rights. The government would not mandate where, you know, whatever should be going on inside their womb. Of course, if, if you've been following the news since 2022, you know that there is a twist to this story, but we'll get to that in a bit. Another victory during the feminist era was taxes. And taxes are a boring topic, but they can also be a big instrument of social change. The government can encourage or discourage some practices through the tax code by taxing alcohol and cigarettes heavily, for example, or giving a tax break to people who buy their own home or go to college or invest in renewable energy. So the tax code was changed at the request of feminists uh, to make it easier to have access to private day care. And if you're a parent like me, you know that daycare is expensive. So as a woman who doesn't get paid that much, well, it might not work financially for that woman to pay five bucks an hour to put her kids in daycare and then make just seven bucks an hour uh, with her day job. And by the time you include income taxes or the cost of transportation into the workplace, that woman is earning nothing and she might as well stay home and raise her child. In fact, the point that is often made by supporters of abortion who are mostly in the Democratic Party nowadays, is that people who are opposed to abortion, i.e. mostly conservative Republicans today, uh, are also opposed to teaching comprehensive sex ed, allowing birth control, the pill, promoting Head Start, or subsidies for daycare centers, and so they are effectively sentencing women, especially poor women, uh, to have babies and then lead a life of poverty because they cannot have a career as well. Well, Nowadays, there is a tax break to help send your kids to daycare or even for people who earn very little money, a direct subsidy by the state to encourage them to enter the workforce. So it became a bit easier to have kids and a career at the same time, to have it all, to use the feminist term, and that led to higher rates of female participation in the workforce. Also, that workforce was more equal for women because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 made it illegal to discriminate based on sex. I covered that act within the context of the civil rights movement because it was meant mostly to end discrimination in public places, to prevent restaurants from creating two public bathrooms, one for blacks and one for whites, for example. Uh, but the Civil Rights Act of 64 also barred discrimination based on sex, not just race, and it applied to all facilities open to the public, including the workplace. So feminists began to sue their employers when they fired a woman because she was pregnant or when they refused to promote her because she was a woman because that was now illegal. The situation is still not perfect today because employers have learned to be discreet when they engage in discrimination, but at least on the surface, businesses now do their best to comply with the law because they know that if they openly discriminate against a woman, they could be sued under the Civil Rights Act of 64. So there had been some progress there. One very male workplace traditionally was the armed forces. And there was also some progress there, both for minorities and for women. Up until 1948, the armed forces were segregated, but President Harry Truman asked for the army to be desegregated after World War II. In the 70s, there was another step forward when the armed forces were open to women as well by default, although there were still some exceptions there even after that date. Up until recently, women could not be in some sectors like the Marines, or in submarines, or they might be a fighter pilot, but only in peacetime. And they could not drop bombs in a combat zone, which limited their opportunities for advancement. But many of these restrictions are being chipped away bit by bit. The last major restriction in the armed forces, though that falls out a bit out of our subject topic for today, would be bans on homosexuality. Because the Civil Rights Act of 64 says that you cannot discriminate against someone based on sex, but it says nothing about sexual orientation. So for a long time, it was still possible to fire a woman because she was a lesbian. In the army, these restrictions were partially lifted under Bill Clinton in the 1990s when the policy became don't ask, don't tell, meaning that you could serve as a gay man or woman in the military as long as you stayed silent about it. However, if you ever came out of the closet, then you would be discharged from the army. That policy was later changed again under the Obama administration to a more neutral policy where you can serve in the military, whether you are gay 
or not. So there was a victory there. And nowadays, a number of state laws also bar discrimination in the workplace based on sexual orientation. Ultimately, the big battle for the feminists in the early 70s was the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, which is a proposed amendment to the Constitution with a very long history going back all the way to the suffragette movement in the 1910s and 1920s. Remember that the original U.S. Constitution said nothing about women or gender equality, so the idea was to fix this through an amendment. And that Equal Rights Amendment itself is very short and simple. It simply states that you cannot discriminate based on sex. The ERA was simple and clear enough that in 1971, with the urging of the National Organization of Women, the U.S. Congress passed the ERA by an overwhelming margin. But an amendment to the Constitution is a bit more complicated to pass than a simple law. So the matter then went to the states after Congress approved it, because three-fourths of the states need to ratify an amendment before it is officially part of the Constitution, and that amounted to 38 out of 50 states. After just a couple of years, 35 states ratified the amendment, so ratification seemed like a done deal. You just needed three more states for the amendment to be a part of the Constitution. And that would be key because every single law that was discriminatory in any state or in Congress would then be immediately struck down as unconstitutional. So it was the one battle that would win the entire war, to put gender equality straight up there in the Constitution. Ratification for the ERA seemed within sight until the mid-70s when we start to see a backlash against feminists. So let's talk about that now, the anti-feminist backlash uh, from the 1970s forward. And normally feminists portray themselves as being not necessarily anti-male. They're about equality between men and women. They want to raise women all the way to the level of men rather than putting down men to an unequal status. But in practice, if you have a pie of a given size and the economic pie was not growing in the 70s because the economy was not doing well, well, if you give more to women, that means that men get a smaller slice of the pie, mathematically. Let's say that in a company, there's a position for senior VP that would have gone to a man back in the 50s. Well, if a woman is promoted instead in the 70s, the man who was competing for the job, well, he might feel left out. There's only one job to go around. Or think about schools. Under the new legal environment, Title IX specified that schools would be funded equally for both boys and girls, which, by the way, is perfectly normal. But that created a problem for sports teams because all the money traditionally would go to boy sports only, but now schools had to make room for female volleyball or softball or soccer per Title IX. And as a result, all these female sports have boomed since the 70s as a result, which is a great development. But if you're a man in the wrestling team and your funding was cut because wrestling is traditionally a male sport and the school needs to make more room for more female athletes, well, you could see as a wrestler how you would have some backlash against the feminist movement uh, because male sports would no longer get the whole pie. Getting a bit off topic here, another development of the 70s was the decline of the working class white male. He used to be the king in the 60s until the civil rights and feminist movements took away the value of being the white man. And working class men used to do well financially as well in the 60s as an auto worker in Detroit, Michigan, for example, until free trade agreements, a general decline of American manufacturing, and tax cuts for the rich pretty much shattered the American working class. Which leads us to the phenomenon of the young, unhappy incel who lives in, in his mom's basement, who has no stable job, and spends his days in online chat rooms railing against women and blacks and immigrants. And unfortunately, because this country has so many freaking guns, that young man will pick up an AR-15 and start killing a bunch of people to vent his frustration. I may be stretching my argument here, but I think there is a logical line that takes us from the rise of the educated female to the decline of the uneducated male to the explosive anger of that stupid incel with a big gun and a small you-know-what. And I'm not sure how to fix this, unfortunately. So, moving on. Back to the ERA. Ultimately, the big battle focused on the Equal Rights Amendment, and the leading figure in the opposition to the ERA, surprisingly, was a woman. Phyllis Schlafly was the leader of the Stop ERA movement. So why would a woman be opposed to an amendment to the Constitution that said that men and women are equal? That seems bizarre, but she had some arguments. Some of them made sense, others not as much in my view. 
let's start with the arguments where she had a point. The 1970s were during or right after the Vietnam War, so she asked, why do we only draft men? Because there is something very unfair about that. Draftees lose one year of their life or two, they get sent overseas, maybe they get injured or even killed, so why do only men go through that? If the IA is passed, well, some man will complain that his sister did not get drafted, he will sue, and he will win because the draft law is indeed discriminatory against men. So there was a chance if the ERA passed that in the future wars, women and men would both be drafted because the only reason that women were not sent to war in the past was based on some outdated notion of womanhood, that women are weak and can't defend themselves and have to stay home as caretaker for the kids. So strike one for Phyllis Schlafly. Another major development in the 60s and 70s was a rise in the divorce rate. The cause of that is complicated. Maybe women were gaining greater access to the workplace, so they finally could ask for a divorce from an abusive husband because they could make it on their own financially, which would be a good thing overall. But there is a social cost to the rise of divorce as well, especially for kids, so people were paying close attention to that rising rate of divorce and the law that went with it. And when those divorces happened in the 70s, typically 99.9% .9 of the time, the woman would get custody of the children and she would get alimony payment from the ex-husband. Why so? Well, again, that was based on the outdated notion that only women can take care of the kids, and also that they're feeble-minded individuals who can't possibly make it on their own financially, so the man, even the ex-husband, is responsible for supporting the ex-wife financially. So Phyllis Schleifly warned women, if the ERA is passed, well, maybe the man will have custody rights half the time. Or maybe women will have to pay alimony to the husband every once in a while. Which, to me, as a divorced dad, seems perfectly fair, but obviously some women in the 70s were concerned about that, given the growing rate of divorces at the time. So, strike two for Phyllis Schlafly. Some of her other criticisms seem a bit out there, at least in my view. She claimed that under the ERA, a man and a woman would have to share the same bathroom because, you know, gender equality, though I doubt that a court would have ever enforced unisex bathroom. She also claimed that the ERA would make abortion legal in the Constitution, and there's no actual word about abortion in the ERA amendment, so I think that criticism was unfair. But all these arguments uh, still struck a chord, and in the end, only 35 states ratified the ERA, and the other 15 states stuck to their guns. Louisiana, where I teach, is one of those holdover states which tend to be concentrated in the south and conservative areas of the country. Just so you know, there is still a campaign to get the ERA ratified because, after all, Congress passed the initial law. 30 states have ratified it, so it is conceivable that, in our day and age, three more states could ratify it finally. Just a couple years ago, I got to attend a committee hearing in Baton Rouge where legislators discussed whether to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, at long last, in Louisiana. And sure enough, all these issues I discussed before, including the sillier ones about the bathrooms and the abortion, all resurfaced during the debate. The project cleared the committee by just one vote that day, but ultimately the full legislature of Louisiana failed to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment yet again. So that is still a debate that is still with us today. Stay tuned. As it turns out, the debate over Roe v. Wade is still with us today because it is simply an interpretation by the Supreme Court. It's not the actual Constitution. It's not a law by Congress. It's just a Supreme Court decision, which the justices can reverse at a later date. And that brings us to current events. I initially taped this video lecture in 2019, and here is what I said at the time. Quote, under the current Trump administration, two new justices were added to the Supreme Court, so you now have a conservative majority, and so a lot of states, including again Louisiana, have passed big bans on abortion that are currently unconstitutional because they violate Roe v. Wade, but the hope is that these bans will be appealed to the courts, eventually make it to the Supreme Court, and then the justices will decide to reverse Roe v. Wade." End of quote. Well, President Trump actually got to appoint a third justice before he left office, so sure enough, the new Supreme Court, with its new 6-3 conservative supermajority, revisited Roe v. Wade in 2022, forcing me to update my PowerPoint and this lecture and re-record the whole thing. So that new decision simply overturned Roe v. Wade. So scratch out all these notes that you took next to the term Roe v. Wade, 
well, don't scratch them completely, but put an asterisk next to them that says this was only valid from 1973 until 2022. So what is the law on abortion now, you might ask? Well, there is no longer a federal mandate, so that varies state by state. That means that more liberal states, typically on either coast of the country, have kept the right to abortion. So pretty much little has changed in those states. But in other more conservative states in the South and Midwest, old law that banned abortion, well, they came back into effect. And some are more stringent than others. Louisiana, as it happens, has one of the strictest laws in the country. No abortion is allowed ever, even in cases of rape or incest. I think there is one uh, exception just for the life of the mother. Other states might allow abortion, but only until six weeks. Texas even has a law that rewards vigilantes who denounce women and doctors who are still getting abortions. So we're back to the situation that was in effect in the 60s. Some women travel across the country to get the abortion anyway, if they can afford it, or they do the abortion on their own and at their own risk using abortion pills, or they follow the law and they carry the baby to term even, they were, even if they were raped by their older brother. That's what the state of Louisiana wants them to do. Uh, this issue has divided the country further, and it's pretty divided right now. We'll see that in the later lectures in this class, uh, between the red states on the one hand and the blue states, uh, because they are abiding by two very different legal and moral codes when it comes to uh, contraception and abortion. I'm taping this in 2023, and the situation remains in flux, because some legislatures are trying to make abortion law even more stringent, and there's also the possibility that the current Supreme Court, which is dominated by religious conservatives, will decide to outlaw abortion all across the country. That is a possibility. Or the pendulum could fling the other way. Overall, a majority of Americans support some abortion rights, so there is significant opposition today. And when referendums on abortion were put before voters in the past few years in various states, even very red states like Kansas, uh, the pro-choice camp as one. So I get the sense that the Supreme Court overreached there and that we'll eventually see some more states switch to the pro-choice camp or even a federal law by Congress that would set a national standard, uh, which to me would seem the most logical option. So stay tuned. I will probably have to re-record that lecture yet again in the future. Let's finish with some other issues that were championed by the National Organization for Women but are still leftover business, such as equal pay for equal work. If you look at this graph, you'll notice that the gap between how much money a man makes and how much women make has narrowed over the years, but it's not fully equal yet. Some of that difference might be based on the fact that women often pick lower paying professions like teaching though I can tell you that some men also pick that profession. Women are also more likely to refuse a promotion or to take time off because they still remain the primary caregiver for kids, and that might derail their career. But in some cases, the pay disparity might be connected to the fact that the women are indeed getting paid less just because of raw discrimination. They don't get promoted as much as men, or they don't get paid the same amount for the same line of work. The only solution there would be to make all salaries public, because it's sometimes difficult for women to know that the guy in the office next door makes an extra $10,000 for the same job. She doesn't even know it. Uh, but if she knew that, she couldn't ask for a raise or win a lawsuit under the Civil Rights Act. The last piece of unfinished business pertains to women in politics. On this graph, you notice that starting in the 70s, 80s, 90s, for any given year, you now have not just one female senator in the U.S. Senate, but maybe 10 or even 20, which is a big step forward. We now have more women in politics, including powerful ones like Nancy Pelosi, who used to be the majority leader in the House, or Kamala Harris, who is the current VP. But you might also say, well, there are 100 senators in the U.S. Senate, so 20 women out of 100 still seems unfair when women represent over 50% of the population overall. So we're back to a glass half full, half empty situation yet again. That next graph represents the same data, but in a different way, showing you the slow rise in the number of female senators, which is encouraging, but as you can see, it's still far below 50%. That upper graph is one that I had a very hard time putting together myself. It represents the number of female presidents year by year. So let's analyze that together. 
the number starts at zero and then it moves to zero and then we end up at zero. The closest we got to a female president was in 2016 when, according to the poll, Hillary Clinton was favored to win the presidency and she did win the popular vote, but she lost in the electoral college. It's a weird aspect of the US electoral system that you can win a majority of the vote nationwide and still lose the election for president. But that's another issue that is not female specific because Al Gore also lost that way in 2000. So the New York Times was so confident that Hillary Clinton would be elected in 2016 that they already made up a mock up of the front page for the next day's newspaper, Madam President. And then, of course, they had to move to plan B halfway through the night when they realized that the Donald would be the next president. That 2016 election was also notable for the intensity of the rhetoric levied at the female candidate. And I'm not saying that every Trump voter was a hardcore sexist. Actually, a lot of white women voted for him. But a small group of hardcore sexists did come out of the closet during that election, uh, calling Hillary Clinton the B-word, which was a bit dispiriting considering all the progress that had been made in previous decades when it came to female representation in politics. Actually, Hillary Clinton had planned to wear some white pants the night of the election in honor of the suffragettes as a way to show her election as the culmination of 100 years of a fight for women's rights. And she also had planned to have a victory party in a building with a huge glass ceiling so that symbolically she would shatter the glass ceiling once and for all. That was another demand of the National Organization of Women, to shatter the glass ceiling in the workplace. And as it happened, the glass ceiling was still very much there at the end of the evening. So here we are, glass half full, half empty kind of situation. If you are a woman or a man and you have strong opinions, either in favor of Roe v. Wade or against it, the only solution is go out and vote, run for office, and get politically active. The one lesson that we have learned from the 1960s is that nothing ever changes in US society until people stand up and get their voices heard. Well, that concludes our section on the reforms of the 1960s, which, as you can see, profoundly changed the society that we live in today, whether it comes to welfare, the war on poverty, whether it comes to race with the civil rights movement, or whether it comes to gender equality, the feminist movement, but only up to a point. History is a living thing, it's still an ongoing process. Next time we'll start a new section that will take us to the 1970s and will allow us to explore a bit more the backlash against liberal ideas and the rise of the new conservative movement.